Hello, my name is Farida Badamusi. I am a Black American woman um, with locks and gold earrings. Um, I am wearing a multicolored dress, which has a lot of oranges and blues and blacks and whites. Um, my background is black and beige with post-its, many multicolored post-its in the background to keep me organized. And I'm very excited to welcome you to the Athena Film Festival. On behalf of Barnard College and Women in Hollywood, it is my honor to welcome you to the 11th annual Athena Film Festival. This festival is dedicated to celebrating the stories of bold, courageous women leaders and the filmmakers who bring these stories to life. Thank you for joining us. This year's festival would not be possible without the support of our dedicated sponsors. Please join me in thanking Athena's founding sponsor, the Artemis Rising Foundation, and its CEO and founder, Regina K. Scully, whose visionary leadership makes our work possible. A special thank you as well to our premier level sponsor, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which shares our commitment to showcasing stories of women in science. To all of our sponsors whose names you will see before each film and event, thank you for your commitment to challenging our culture to be more inclusive and inspiring audiences in the process. This year, we wanted to create something new and exciting to bring to our audience. So we are programming eight different program areas that we believe react and respond to our current moment. This conversation is part of our Tear It Down, Dismantling White Supremacy program area. In this program area, we take a look at people organizing and taking action to tear down systems of oppression. The title of this panel is Decolonizing Documentary, and it is an important part of this program area, which is sponsored by Hanky Panky. I'm very pleased to welcome Maria Fortes Morse, who will be moderating this conversation and will introduce our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rita, and thank you so much to the Athena Film Festival for hosting this panel and for bringing us together around this important topic. My name is Maria Fortes Morse. I am a light skinned Latinx indigenous woman, and I am located uh, in my living room, and I have uh, redwood panels behind me, and I'm on a green, dark green velvet couch, and I'm wearing a dark blue. Uh, uh, collared shirt, and I have long brown hair. Um, and I uh, am cu currently in San Francisco, which is the ancestral lands of the Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area. And I use the pronouns she and her. And I'm going to pass the mic to Lagaya. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me in conversation with you all. Uh, my name is Lagaya Romero. Uh, I am a non-binary Filipinx American person with long black hair, wearing a black turtleneck and mustard yellow hat, sitting in front of a bunch of plants and a cream wall. Um, what else can I share? Uh, my pronouns are they or he. Um, and I am calling in from the traditional and ancestral territory of the Munsi Lenape and Canarsi peoples. Thank you. And Tony, could you introduce yourself to us? Yes, um, thank you uh, for having us here at the Athena Festival. Uh, my name is Tony Kamau. Um, I am a light brown skinned um, African woman. Um, I have, um, I'm wearing glasses. I'm wearing red lipstick, um, blonde braids, and I have a pink shirt um, in my bedroom. Uh, behind me um, is, my, is a gray textured wall that kind of looks like wallpaper. And I'm wearing um, a headscarf, an African printed headscarf. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm, I'm zooming in from Nairobi, Kenya in East Africa. I'm really happy to be here and passing the mic to Christina. Hi, my name is Christina Matwani. Um, I'm a documentary editor and I'm based in San Francisco. Um, I am a mixed race Indian American. Pronouns are she and her. And um, my image is, is that I am a light skinned woman with long uh, dark brown hair. And my background is a white wall with a cat pillow and a uh, red blanket. Wonderful, and uh, it's wonderful to meet all of you here today, and especially to convene around this important discussion around decolonizing documentary. And I just wanna begin the conversation, uh, opening up the conversation by asking each of you to answer from your personal 
uh, perspective and, and, and professional experience, what does decolonizing documentary mean to you? Ligaya, would you be open to answering that question first? <laughs> Yeah, I love that question. Thank you for offering it. Um, well, I think my first thought is that, um, you know, we've learned from uh, Native American organizers and filmmakers that decolonization is not a metaphor. Um, decolonization is the actual repatriation of indigenous land and life. So when I think about documentary and decolonization, I think about what are the stories we need and what are the practices of care, consent, community um, orientation and reciprocity um, that we need to remember and send and recenter, right? Um, so that's something I think about a lot too is like not just product, but process. What are the processes of, deco of decolonization um, in documentary? Um, and how can our stories and the documentaries that we, that we create work toward that larger decolonial imagination, right? The, the, um, the collective work that we're doing toward land back, toward abolition, anti-capitalism, and transformative justice, which I see as like pillars of, you know, um, actual decolonization. Thank you, Lakaya. And Tony, do you can you answer the question also? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I loved your answer, Lakaya. It was uh, very uh, well spoken. Um, I think to me, decolonizing documentary is just about being truthful about, I think, the history of documentary. It's a Western form of storytelling, um, which has a history and, you know, uh, of being a colonial visual, um, a remnant of a colonial visual culture. Um, it was an, a lot of documentary, especially in places like the Global South and Africa was about like ethnography and looking at other cultures and uh, packaging them for Western audiences to be able to understand. And, and there's a lot of otherizing that was happening in documentary and still does um, to this day. Um, and also just looking at the truth of what the industry is right now, it's it's still today dominated by a largely white male Western perspective and lens across the value chain from higher education to content creation, to funding, to festival curation, um, to awards voting. I mean, we just had the Golden Globes <laughs> where there were very few BIPOC um, nominees in media categories. So for me, de decolonizing is just first being truthful <laughs> about what this industry actually is um right now and uh with truth as a first step would then be looking at what do we need to dismantle what do we need to reimagine um what practical measurable steps do we need to take to have true inclusion and not just have tokenism uh which has been um, kind of been offered as a solution in the past. And now we're saying uh, tokenism isn't enough. Uh, we need to really just talk about dismantling this um, institutions that cater to a specific gaze and audience. Wonderful, thank you so much, Tony and Christina. Um, well, I, I feel like my answer is not gonna be quite as well thought out as the other two because they said all the good stuff. And, but but I, mostly the way that I look at it as a, like as a simple way is decolonizing documentary is really taking a hard look at the gaze and who is telling this story. And further than that, who is also on their crew, not only um, you know the physical labor of the crew, but also the creative. Where I think when we think of the tokenization of, you know, we, we get a black PA for a black story. Mm -hmm. It's more than that. We need to um, change the creative because that's really where the gaze. Mm -hmm. Short answer, easier answer than, the, than these well thought out answers that these, that these other people have. No, I think I think that's that's wonderful. And um, mm -hmm. I also just wanted to say that throughout this conversation, if you have anecdotes from your personal experiences, I know you are all very accomplished in your in your practice. And so if you have an example of an anecdote of, of how the decolonized decolonizing documentary applies within your work, that would always be 
welcome addition to the conversation. Um, and uh, the next question, I think, dovetails nicely into, into this introduction to the concept of what decolonization means, which is thinking about um, what does a decolonized lens look to you, look like to you in your practice and also within the field at large? And what are the measurable, uh, ask, like what, what can we speak about in a very specific way that goes into creating a decolonized lens within documentary? Hi, um, I'd like to take a go at it. Um, I would say a decolonized lens, um, and I'm just going to go back to truth telling because I think that that's just so important um, at this moment in time globally. Um, I think it's just first about acknowledging and acknowledging and correcting for past and ongoing biases um, originating, you know, in colonial structures and experiences. Um, because first we have to acknowledge <laughs> that there is an issue and that there is a problem before we can actually think of practical um, solutions that are actually inclus inclusive. And for me, one practice, and I'm speaking from the perspective of being an African-based um, storyteller, is also seriously exploring um, the fact that we shouldn't be beholden to one standard of excellence when determining what is or isn't an appropriate way to tell a story in a documentary form. I mean, in Africa, we have call and response um, storytelling that's a huge part of our culture. And when, and when it comes to funding documentaries from our part of the world, um, when you're applying to major grant organizations, um, they're not open to exploring different forms of uh, narrative or different approaches um, to, to documentary storytelling. So for me, I would, um, speaking specifically as an African-based um, filmmaker, I would just say it's about like expanding what excellence looks like. Christina, in your experience as an editor, can you speak to that, the, the lens in particular? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people probably um, think of the lens as as kind of coming from the director's eye, but you know, in in documentary, so much of this is um, a collaborative experience, and so I would you know argue that the gaze is also coming from the editor and and the other people um, involved in making of the film. Um, I think in America. It's like um, the gaze doesn't necessarily always have to be the person, um, you know, from the same level as the person that um, that the gaze is upon, because America, in a way, is somewhat of a melting pot. But I think you also have to be careful because all of these people in this melting pot have had different experience, and so it just gets complicated. Like it's not. Um, a cookie cutter like, oh, this is a story about black Americans, only black Americans can tell this story. It's also like how, when you get deeper into that story, what is actually, what are we exploring in the story or um, all of those different things. So it's just like such an individual basis, a story by story that it's, um, I think it has to be thought of very carefully about where the gaze in the lens is coming from um, in each individual uh, situation. Magaya. Yeah, I really love both of those answers and they're really making me just think so much about um, my own process. And I've been thinking a lot about how in order to have a decolonial lens, you have to know what the colonial lens is, right? It's like y'all are saying, it's the water that we're all swimming in. And so you need to be able to identify the water and know know its taste, know its, know its look, right? Um, uh, because I think, yeah, and then you have to ask yourself, like, is the narrative that I am uplifting through my work, is it, um, is it defying that colonial narrative? Is it defying that colonial process or is it subverting it? Is it direct, is a direct challenge to it, right? Um, and by direct challenge, I also don't necessarily mean, like we deserve to have stories that are rom-coms too, right? Like romance and, and comedy, you know, comedy things that aren't always like about our trauma and our suffering. So I think that in itself is a direct challenge, but you have to, you have to know what narratives have been actively suppressed and silenced um, in order to know which ones you want to uplift, right? Um, 
and I guess I'm thinking a lot too about like the lens being, it needs a power analysis. Like I feel like what, often I'll talk about consent, right? And I'll think about like, I want to have a practice of consent in my filmmaking that is enthusiastic consent, informed consent, affirmative consent, right? Like all the things that we're hopefully practicing in our romantic and our sex lives, you know? And then, but when I bring that up, especially to journalists, they'll say like, whoa, 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 like that that can lead to biased filmmaking that can lead to like people having, you know, um, that can lead to um, fluff pieces or like only PR stories, right? But that lacks a, a power analysis. If I were making a film about a cis white racist president, I don't know, you know what I mean? No, I wouldn't be asking consent because that power analysis is, is punching up to use like, you know, first amendment terminology. Um, I'm punching up and so I wouldn't, yeah, that's like not the same level or lens that I would put on it. But if I'm working with my own community and certainly other communities that have been actively silenced by white supremacy and by colonial um, uh, erasure and narratives, then of course I would be practicing consent. Of course I would want to be centering meaningful collaboration in that work, right? So all that to say, like I think about, I think the decolonial lens is the imagination to completely tell stories like in another plane from the violence and the suffering that we've experienced, but it's also an understanding um, and an intention of what has been our history and how to how to subvert and leave that behind. I, I just have a quick response I'd like to give to Lagaya's comment that just ma it made me think of something. When you talk about that we also deserve to have rom-coms but that is even subversive if you think about it, like because that, that hasn't existed. So yeah, I think that's a really interesting way to think about it, that it doesn't always have to be this like, oh, when we show you know, ho horrible things that have happened to people of color, that's not the only like w way of decolonizing. It's also like being subversive in the way of like, we've never seen um, you know, people of color behaving this way on screen, and this is more like real life than than the other representations that we've seen, and that's that's so subversive, actually, in such a great way. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's a great. Uh, um, just adding on to what the two of you are saying. Um, I think it's also just understanding, like, no one has a single story, uh, which is what. I feel is problematic about um, <laughs> about a lot of the storytelling that's been taking place in um, diverse communities. Like someone comes in and they just want to tell a particular story. Um, for example, Kenya, we're struggling with our democracy. And if someone wants to tell a story about an activist, they will just show them being beaten on the streets. They're going to show news clips, showing the violence, um, ETC, and they wouldn't necessarily want to deep, um, dig deeper into the subjects personal lives you can have joy and suffering and you can fall in love and you cannot be a nice person you can be marginal you, you can be marginalized you can still oppress others like life is complicated it's messy and it's about being able to um i think remove if, even if you come from that community like understand that there's nuance um in the everyday lived experience. And sometimes it's easier when you come from that community to understand that. And even if you don't, it's about approaching a situation, being open um, to seeing what is before you as opposed to coming in with your own agenda and your own narrative that you want to um, impose on a community um, that has its own narrative. Um, I'm gonna tell you a funny anecdote. Um, there's, there's, um, the, the, there's a channel that does a lot of stories in Africa and they've come under fire um, for their type of storytelling because they go a lot into cultural myths um, and it's usually like white directors, white British directors that they're sending out into the field and many times when we are watching as African audience members, um, we are all, like most of the comments on social media are like, um, seriously, um, this is not what they do. <laughs> you know, like um, this is what the urban legend is about this kind of cultural myth. Why didn't you go into that? Why didn't you go into that? But then these white directors, because it's parachute reporting, they're going into a certain situation and 
um, taking everything at face value and not even appreciating the fact that many times a lot of the subjects have seen how this um, global broadcaster portrays Africans on their news shows and they just play to character. And a lot of time they'll be playing stereotypes because that's what they think they want. Um, so I think that that's interesting because it was the, the, yeah, the, there was like a huge debate over a private investigator in Kenya and she was just basically, she staged the entire documentary. Um, she, she hired a location, she pretended she was an investigative documentary storyteller and the white directors uh, investigative um, private detective and the white documentary filmmakers accepted it hook, line and sinker and we as everyone could tell that, it, that she was just basically um, sorry pardon my French taking the piss um, and if it was someone who had actually spent time in that community they would have realized that so uh, yeah um, for me it's just understanding that everyone is messy everyone's allowed to be messy and sorry, I just like need yeah. to respond to that also. But I, it just you you had such a great point. I think as an editor, I think about this. All is usually like from somebody outside of that community, or um, you know, not you know, a cis white man. It tends to be that the characters that 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 person can relate with, or the subjects that that person can relate with, will be nuanced, right? but that the people outside of their kind of experience, it will be black or white, right? Like all good, all bad. And so like as an editor, I feel like I try my best to show nuance in every subject um, in, the, in whatever film I'm doing, whether they're, you know, uh, of whatever color, of whatever community, because the truth is, is we all know, no people are all good or all bad, right? Like even the worst person, like, our ex-president, right? Had to have moments where he is. So, you know, just some something extra to think about that I, when you were saying that, it just popped in my head about how I, I try to think about the nuance of characters. And I think that that's something that's lacking a lot of times when the lens um, is coming from a certain, you know, perspective. And I just wanted to jump in here too and just, say that um, I have worked often directing in in foreign countries and, and I'm also a cinematographer, so so shooting in, in foreign countries. And one of the things that I know I've learned sometimes the hard way um, is the importance of really trusting your team and asking them, do gut checks constantly and asking, is, am I getting this right? Is my entire premise of even being here the right premise? Um, and then again, I, I loved what Lagaya said about enthusiastic consent. So I'll oftentimes share with subjects from my personal background um, about what it's like to be, you know, from my family. I have a, a multiracial family, multi-class family, um, and some of my own history that connects to whatever story that we're telling. And in expressing that vulnerability, oftentimes subjects will then open up to me and say, you know, what you're trying to say, it's 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 almost what's happening here but not not really like let me show you this whole other dimension of the story that that maybe you haven't considered and it's from that place of vulnerability and asking for reciprocity between myself as the person either behind the camera or the person directing and from a person who is you know from a community that i know very little about um that we're able to have these really deep meaningful conversations and build trust and build a sense of of reciprocity and then i would just add to that it's so important in these relationships when you're trying to decolonize the lens is to really think about who this film is for and to tell the subjects who this film is for because i think that gives them a sense of like purpose if if they're raising awareness about a human rights issue they understand what's at stake and that what they're doing is going to be helping raise awareness about an issue um, and if it's not, if it's something that's more entertainment driven to also disclose that, that this is a for-profit film and let them make the decision whether or not they wanna be participating in that type of venture. Um, and I just believe very much in transparency and accountability with subjects because your transparency allows people to understand if it's worth their while. And accountability is saying like, this is what I'm going to give to you um, and, and also giving people 
uh, you know, either in their contracts or otherwise levers so that they can hold you accountable for what whatever you've promised to do in safeguarding their stories. Um, that's just that's my my perspective here. Um, but I want to bring the 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 question back to here. Um, time out for one second. <laughs> I lost my place. Okay. Um, and in bringing this question back, I think it's a really, and, and this is just again building on the question of the lens, is what do you see within the industry and also within you know just the the parrot you know the the let me start again. What do you see as barriers to change, and what are the systems? that need to change to decolonize documentary? I can start. It's the gatekeepers. It's the, it's the money. <laughs> it's how these, you know, these films made by filmmakers of color who are from the communities that they are making the films about get their foot in the door. The, the gatekeepers, um, you know, it's just it, that door's not open yet. Um, and maybe sometimes one person gets their foot in there, right? But like, it's not open enough yet. So that's my big answer is it's the gatekeepers that we need to change here. I'll add to that and I'll say, well, definitely the gatekeepers, like Christina said, and I'll add to that and I'll say the audiences too, mm -hmm. right? I think the audience, well, one, we all know that so many of the documentary films that are are supported and and funded and win awards are meant for primarily white audiences. It's like what Tony was saying. You know, it's a very like Western um, white dominant audience, and they they expect a certain kind of story. You know what I mean? Um, so if for me, I, I I would love to see a change in the audiences that we make our films for switching over to more of like a by us for us model. Um, but I'd also love to see a collective shift across all audiences to a more, to just like a higher awareness, right? Like I think in a lot of ways, um, people are always looking for something new, but essentially they want the same story, right? They want the white savior story. They want the story that makes them feel good about, you know, um, about the small, yeah, piece that they that they put on. And uh, sorry, that wasn't like really articulate. I, I guess I'm just saying that, like, you know, um, they want the, the they want the exotic or the othering. They don't want they don't actually want something radically different. Is what I've noticed. Or um, certainly, like, you could look at what the films that are that are getting a lot of the awards that are made by these cis white men and are about, you know, about BIPOC, sorry, about BIPOC communities. Um, you know, even the ones that do have like a good intention are still working within a, a white savior model and not a solidarity model. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, totally echo what you're saying um, about gatekeepers, about audiences. Um, and I think I'll add, Sorry, I keep on circling back to this, just brutal honesty. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of dishonesty. Um, what I think sometimes some filmmakers have been disingenuous, disingenuous, um, especially people doing verite and observational documentary about what their actual process is. Um, and, and also a lot of like just not being honest about the fact, like I think there's this fallacy around the idea of um, unbiased journalism, you know, we're trying to be balanced and there's no way <laughs> you're doing a documentary. I mean, you have an opinion, you have a point of view. That's why you're going out there and telling the story. So like this fallacy that's been there for a while that yes, I'm an unbiased um, storyteller. Um, I can tell every story and remove myself <laughs> from the process um, and remove my lens from the process. I mean, that's an absolute fallacy that we just need to confront. And we need to just have people being brutally honest about what their actual process is, because there's a lot of staging. There's a lot of that people don't talk about. I remember there was this 
controversy. I can't remember if it was Channel 4 or BBC um, when they used to do a lot of these ethnographic um, type of documentaries about tribes. And there was a tribe, um, sorry, and even the term tribe <laughs> is um, is problematic, but there was, there was a community that they went to and the community used to live in trees a long time ago. They used to they build their houses in trees and it was an indigenous community and they stopped building their houses in trees and they were told by the director to build tree houses so that they could film. Uh, they could film them living in the tree houses because it looked better. And this, and I think this was uncovered after there was an investigation or a complaint about the documentary. And then the, the directors owned up and said, oh, actually, uh, we made them so, like sit in the trees. Um, and a lot of this is just from the history of um, ethnographic filmmaking, you know, even with Nanook from the North. You know, that was presented as fact. And then we found out, I mean, later on you find out, oh, a lot of the stuff was staged. So I just think just brutal honesty. We need a lot of that. Just people keeping it real, <laughs> I would say. Yeah, and you're making me think of, there was a piece um, by Teju Cole a couple of years ago about Steve McCurry, that famous National Geographic photographer, um, and how when he was photographing in India, and this is contemporary, right? So just to connect exactly what you're saying and lo the long tradition of 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 um, fallacy in documentary and like Nanook of the North all the way up to today, this is a contemporary photographer when he is filming in India he would be really selective and never show people on their phones or in any type of technology because that idea of like modernity was against, you know, the container, the story that he wanted to tell that colonial gaze of like, yeah, like um, it's a really good piece. I think it's called a too perfect picture, but you're really making me think too about in the Philippines, like there were all these photographs that the U S government took when they were acquiring us as a colony. And in those photographs, you can see, you know, like there are people who are, you know, who are nude or are topless, but then you see their clothes on the side, like folded, you know what I mean? And they, so it's like, th that's what I mean by like, you know, from the white colonial gaze audiences, want a different story, but it's the same story. They expect to see like, you know what I mean? They have an idea of what what we look like. And if we don't actually look like that, then they'll change reality to fit what they want or expect us to look like. And I, I just wanna speak really quickly to um, Lagaya's earlier comment about the audience. Um, I think documentary has this kind of history of not to, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, of being somewhat elitist, right? You have to be a, an academic-minded person to watch documentary, and it's only accessible in these certain ways to even watch. And I want to say, like, this year with the pandemic and everything that's happened, I can feel that there's a shift starting to happen where this, I feel like we're opening up to um, bigger audience, to a wider audience, to a more diverse audience, just in the way that um, the Sundance Film Festival happened this year, which is normally quite, kind of an elitist thing. Most people can't afford to go to Sundance and most people, you know, can't uh, enjoy these films. And some of these films never get, you know, distribution or they get distribution on a very specific platform that's hard to find or is inaccessible unless you have a lot of money. And this year you could buy one $15 ticket and you could see a film. And it probably is a film that you would never, that some people would never watch. And so I love that it feels like we're starting to get to a point where we can start to access these audiences that normally wouldn't see documentaries or see um, themselves on screen. And they can also be critical of how that is being portrayed. So it just feels like we're at a precipice where things are opening up with the audience. Um, I love I love what Christina just said about Sundance and also just thinking, um, I think a lot about how the industry um, is shifting and changing in response to audience, audiences becoming more diverse and wanting to see great cinema um, at a, an affordable price. And I, I really am excited to see that there are people who in within the, within our communities who are trying to innovate the ways in which films can be distributed. Um, either on mainstream platforms or creating their own platforms um, where, where, where our films can be seen more widely. And I'm really excited to see how that 
shifts and changes. Um, Cause I think the breaking up of silos of how we see and consume culture um, so that it's not just like, oh, this type of person will watch on this type of platform and that type of person will watch on that type of platform and millennials look at this and Generation Z looks at that and baby boomers look at that. I think the more we can kind of mix it up and, and make things more open, I think that can really help a lot to help us as, as filmmakers who are in the medium trying to decolonize it actually have the audiences that we need and also uh, revenue streams that we need to continue doing our work in a sustainable way. Um, and moving on to the, our next question. Um, and then dovetailing from, from this discussion, um, how can we engage with current gatekeepers um, in the industry to bring about film colon decolonization? And when I think of gatekeepers, I'm thinking both of people who are uh, curators of films, sort of people who are writing about film or deciding what films are received into either festivals or into awards, and also people who are uh, funders of films, and that could be either philanthropic organizations, or it could be individuals, or it could be major streamers and tastemakers. So, what, how, just and, and other other types of gatekeepers too. But just, what are your thoughts on how we can engage with them um, to, to to bring about this change that is much needed? Um, I, I think I would say uh, I noticed Christina and Legalia, um, and I think you, Maria, are also members of Brown Girls Doc Mafia, um, which I'm also a member of. Um, there are actually a lot of Kenyan and African members. Yay! <laughs> and I, I would just say that that's an amazing example. Um, uh, Yabo and you know the, all the organizing that she's done. You know, because I think first of all we need to organize. We need to organize across borders. Um, we need to organize as BIPOC uh, people and speak as one voice uh, to the gatekeepers because also when we speak um, individually to protect our own interests or to be the tokens who are allowed to sit not even at the table but next to it, um, then what you do is you create temporary access or you create a temporary situation that's beneficial until the next, you know, flavor in town um, comes in or premieres at the next A-list festival. Um, yeah, so I think it's I think the number one thing is organizing, and I'm just so inspired by what Brown Girls Doc Mafia has been able to do in terms of speaking to the gatekeepers, the broadcasters, having panels where they're talking openly about their processes. Um, you know, I've seen that there are film critic associations for people of color. Um, we need more of that. Um, there are some festivals that, um, I mean, we showed our documentary Soft Tea at Sundance, and the festival programmers have reached out and asked if there are any other filmmakers from Kenya or mm. Africa that I might know of. And I do as much as possible to introduce <laughs> to as many people and Sundance has also been reaching out, I think, to different African filmmakers, asking for readers from diverse backgrounds, because you also need, I mean, that's when it comes to funding organizations, the first lens is those readers. Like if it's going to be people from certain elite schools, you know, who are reading, um, you know, grad schools who are reading these um, applications, then it's a certain kind of film that's going to make it to the next um you know, kind of a level. So, uh, yeah, I, I just think it's um, organizing and just um, and and, just, and being an ally. You know, um, be truly being an ally and truly like opening the door uh, for other people. I ha I worked on a film recently. It was just at Sundance called Homeroom about young people of color who are activists. And I'll use this saying that I'm stealing it from them. They say. We we don't want to be on the menu. We want to be at the table. And I think that that is a very poignant saying, and I'll give them credit for it. <laughs> it's from the kids, not from me. But um, I think that's a very poignant uh, statement. And I feel like we're at, again, at this precipice of a sea change, but I'm just very cost cautiously optimistic about it because at this point it feels like a lot of talk and uh, you know the, the action hasn't fully happened yet. But I've noticed that there are 
um, more people of color mm -hmm. who are being programmers at some of these festivals. And I, I wonder sometimes if that's coming from um, an optics situation, but at the same time, I kind of don't care if they come in and they're like killing it, even if they got put there because of optics, I'll take it at this point. But also I think with the Brown Girls Doc Mafia and when we get numbers, then we get a seat at the table. Then we're not on the menu and we can, um, you know, put pressure, which is something that I think we have to do. Um, and I think we're doing that, but it's, it's like a constant, um, it's a constant battle to do that. Oof, I'm getting chills by everything y'all are saying. I'm so excited. Yes to Brown Girls Doc Mafia. Yes to putting pressure. Um, yeah, I think there's so many really uh, incredible groups that are are um, organizing, like you said, Tony, right? And like, and um, not settling, we're not settling for scraps anymore, you know? Um, something that someone introduced to me recently was that Frederick Douglass quote, um, power concedes nothing without a demand. So, you know, like these gatekeepers aren't gonna out of the goodness of their hearts, just be like, yes, let's let's all of a sudden give up our power and our, you know, privilege. No, like organizing and putting pressure and divesting, I think is a big part of it too, right? I've been, that's been on, um, the top of my mind for uh, for a lot of this past year under COVID, to be honest, is that idea of divesting. You know, like they have cultural weight and power because collectively we give it to them. And what um, what would it look like if we divested from some of these institutions that have proven to be immovable? You know, um, I don't necessarily mean completely because I feel like we all need to do what we have to do to to have our our basic needs met, right? Um, to pay our rent, to to buy our groceries. But what does that look like in the long run over the course of our, our lifetime to divest from capitalism, from Sundance, from, you know, um, certainly from the Oscars. But <laughs> but uh, um, but the last thing I'll say about that is, um, yes, uh, Sonia Childress, who writes a lot about documentary as a tool for liberation, said something to me recently about um, forming a new center of gravity right, a new, a new focal point for us to orbit around. And I thought that was such a beautiful and powerful analogy because I see us as all these like little moons orbiting around, right, this, this being pulled in by like the center of gravity by these like white supremacist systems and capitalist systems. And what would it look like for, for another center of gravity to grow so much force that we can, our little moon selves can just like hop over onto that other orbit. And I think it's Black Star and I think it's Brown Girls Doc Mafia. And I think it's, you know, like Firelight and A Doc and whatnot. So I'm excited about it's a great time to be alive <laughs> um, and be a documentary filmmaker. Yeah. And going off what Lagaya said, I just think of all the wonderful organizing that's happening that's creating that new center of gravity. And then that there's so much work that still has to be done um, and that I'm excited to see where that that goes. Um, I, I think a lot about uh, when I think about gatekeepers and, and sort of institutional power structures, I think a lot about how we can use transparency around data um, to specifically look at numbers and, and in a very detailed way, not just kind of superficial, like, oh, this was a film by a filmmaker of color. Great. Like, no, let's look let's look at let's look at this in, in as detailed a way as possible even if that adds extra sort of bureaucratic paperwork to the funder's plate and to the grantee applicant's plate because i think that for example uh stacy dr stacy smith at usc annenberg is doing this inclusion initiative which is really if you haven't checked it out she um, has you know sort of originated the concept of the in inclusion writer um that was uh that's been talked about specifically for female directors of narrative films, but that same concept of trying to look at the hiring process as a site of potential unconscious bias and, and, and act and very intentionally making an effort to hire or to at least interview diverse candidates for every single position on your film crew, um, not just the director, but everything from the PA all the way up to your, your, your DP, um, 
to, to when you do that, it actually creates, it helps to undo this unconscious bias and then having the data to, to back that up to say, yes, I did call diverse candidates. Yes, I did hire diversely. Um, that that can actually be a really wonderful mechanism for change. And that's something that we can advocate for as BIPOC people um, within our within our communities. And I, and I hope that, that people will really start to look at that as a potential way of diversifying the pipeline of talent, starting with the, you know, starting all the way through the entire production. Um, and also, I just love the idea of <laughs> this, uh, like, positivity, you know, like that, that when you create new, like, new centers of gravity that are, like, positive, and that are affirming, and that I think like the most radical thing as a person of color is to be happy. Like I had a, one of my professors in college who is a, a black feminist theorist, she said that and I just was like, that's so true. Um, so she's like, the most radical thing you guys can do is to be happy. <laughs> and I'm like, yes. Um, and uh, so I think about that a lot, just like what is it that we can do to bring joy to our work? Um, it, our work will be difficult. Our work, we look at very difficult issues, but that that can so help sustain us. Um, through through the challenges, the ups and downs, um, and I just have one comment yeah. about Lagaya's idea too about the center of gravity, and then bringing it back to like my metaphor from the kids <laughs> is like we make our own table, and then do we invite them, <laughs> or are they on the menu? <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. We want to yeah just talk about our metaphors quickly. <laughs> Um, and and this is in the last my my next question is is looking at um, what are the ways that that we can address and to combat tokenism um, or or in addition to tokenism the unicorn syndrome. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I've been tokenized for sure, um, and. I think sometimes when that happens to you, you feel guilty about it too. You're like, why did I agree to do this? It's on me. But like at the end of the day, it, it's a systemic problem. And like, I had to pay my bills, right? Like that's part of the reason why I took, oh, and also like maybe it wasn't framed to me in that, in that way in the beginning. And then as you go on in the project, you see it. I'm not quite sure what the best way to combat it is. And I don't know if it's mm -hmm. our, work like I don't know if it's on me to combat it do you know what I mean like I feel like that's work that needs to be done by the people who are doing it <laughs> um but I don't have a great answer for it I just wanted to comment that I've I've been in that position before and I'm sure everybody on this panel has yeah, I'll speak to it really quickly but I'm a, a female cinematographer and my field is very male dominated and very, there's a lot of machismo and, and even misogyny. Um, and I would just say like, uh, I have gotten jobs as in my role as cinematographer, where it was specifically stated to me that we hired you because you're a woman, because you're Latinx. Um, and for me, those jobs, some, some, like certain of those jobs um, were absolutely critical to my advancing in my career. If they ha if the person hiring hadn't said that we're looking specifically to support affirmative action in our hiring practices, um, I would not have been hired and I would not have had that opportunity to, to learn and to grow and to better myself in my, in my craft. Um, that being said, it wasn't necessarily an easy working environment because um, oftentimes it was still a very white male dominated working environment. And even the people who are not white men would look at me and assume that I was less capable than my white male peers. And I had that, you know, kind of like a little bit of the imposter syndrome because I, I knew I'd been hired because I was a diverse candidate. But I also worked really, really hard to prove all of them wrong that I was actually capable. Um, and as, as, as capable in my craft, as technically proficient, as able to deliver beautiful imagery for the director um, as any of my peers. So I, I don't think there's necessarily like 
when I think about tokenism, I think about it more as being a superficial thing where it's like it's done to check a box or to highlight, to sort of give the veneer, sort of almost like this, like, like a, like a superficial coat of paint, you know, and it's, and so that's why I don't like tokenism, but I think that the practice of affirm it, it's important to distinguish between creating opportunities that are consistent and that in a culture that is supportive of diversity in the workplace or within the film set um, or within, you know, the film festival. Um, but that, that it's important to kind of distinguish between tokenism and um, really amazing efforts at creating inclusivity um, through, through inclusive hiring and curation practices. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, um, I, I agree with what both of you said, um, especially with Christina, because, yeah, why should it be our job <laughs> to fix We've this? We've taken out enough. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. We got enough work to do. That's not yeah. like, you know, it's just like, it's not my job to like hold your hand through your feelings about what's happening. Um, even though like, obviously I want to with my friends and the, you know, other, other people in my life, but it's like, I've got enough work going on here, you know, yeah. and sometimes it's, it's all, all that you can muster to keep your head above water. Like, you know, sometimes you got to delegate the work here. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Because it's a, it's a difficult question because you're talking about like hiring policies, you're talking about diversity and inclusion policies. Um, for I, um, I watched. Um, um, I can never say her name properly. Uh, Rosina St. James. So she did this really interesting um, masterclass on on just what it means to be. She, she's a Netflix uh, CMO. So she did a masterclass on like what it means, you know, to be a woman of color working in you know, C-suite jobs, C-suite jobs. And I, I, I remember something that stuck with me um, that was amazing was she talked about, it doesn't matter how you got into the room. It matters what you do when you're in the room as a first, as a first, um, you know, as a first step, because yes, I mean, I've also been been hired um, as a token, but I think sometimes it's, and I know other people who are in positions where they've been hired as a token role, where they thought they would be tokens, but then it's like, what do you do when you get there? Like, how do you, how how do you ensure that this goes down in your CV in an interesting way or, or resume in an interesting way? And then how can you create spaces for other people? And something very interesting that she talked about was allyship, um, about um, radical honesty with her friends. So she has like a circle of friends and they're radically honest about like how much they're paid, what the role actually is, what the responsibility is, um, which Brown Girls Dog Mafia has done. Uh, kudos to them again. Um, and then what they do with this circle of friends, I think it's like, she, she says like a six women, um, they talk to each other and then they say, um, they, they discuss their goals and where they want to be in the next six years. And then they talk about each other's goals and what they're doing in every single room that they enter into. So even if you're a token, you're speaking about other people who whose voice is not necessarily represented, but you're there as their ally to represent them in different rooms. And maybe it's about gaming the system to a certain degree <laughs> as the people who need to fix <laughs> the problem um eventually get around to it um i i don't think yeah i know i went about it a roundabout way but yeah no i love that i love um all that you shared um and also i feel like i want to i'm sorry to for all of us for the experiences that we've been through you know being tokened in that way like you said marie i mean it doesn't feel good you know what i mean it doesn't feel good when you feel like you're being you're just like a performative band-aid on um on you know, a white dominant crew. And um, something that I'm thinking about too, is that, um, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, that's my remi my reminder to get ready for class, which I have after this. <laughs> um, uh, something that I was thinking about 
is it like, you know, we talked earlier about having to redefine the definition of merit, right? Um, and move it away from kind of like a white supremacist and um, elitist definition of merit. So like if, if, if one of the definitions of merit right now is, is production value, right? Like we've got drones everywhere, everything's on a, you know, a gimbal, it looks so great, cinematic, Zeiss lenses, blah, 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 blah right? Um, then of course, that the the people who are considered deserving of merit are going to be the people who have access to that equipment who have access to larger crews and 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 who even put value in that kind of gaze uh, and that definition of merit right and i'm thinking about like what would it look like for our definition of merit to be changed more to be community oriented so for example like if i if I were working on a documentary in the Philippines and I'm Filipinx, but I'm Filipinx American, right? Like if I went and I intentionally built my team and sought out the, you know, the creative leads to be people who are specifically Filipinx from that town and that story where that's, you know, the story is that I'm filming. To me, that's not tokening, that's being intentional because what I'm doing is I'm redefining my definition of merit to say that you come with 35 years of experience of living in this town, in addition to being a great cinematographer, in addition to, you know what I mean? So like when I'm looking at the, the, the resumes or whatever, we're building our team, sure, maybe there's a cis white man who is better at, you know, using a, um, a steady cam, but when I look at what I need to intentionally and, and thoughtfully tell this story, I would take the person who has 35 years of lived experience and, and a thoughtful connection to the community over someone who, you know, we could all, we could all learn steady cam later, right? I don't know. But so I'm just thinking about that where, because I've also heard this like strange flipped narrative about tokening, tokening where it's like I've I've spoken to white filmmakers and I've been like why are there no people of color on your team and they say well I didn't want to token anyone and I'm like wow that is like a, some mental narrative gymnastics of like <laughs> you know so I guess I'm saying it's like it all has to become a complex consideration of 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 gatekeeping how who what stories are what stories are right for us to tell, what teams should be telling those stories and what is the new definition of merit that, that then shapes our process and the final product of the film, right? Anyway, I was rambling a little bit, but so much to say about tokening. Well, look, I, I loved I loved everything you were saying, and I think that the one thing I did want to say is that, and I didn't say it before, is that there is value in diversity. Like there have been studies um, looking at how diverse teams actually outperform less diverse teams. Um, I know it's because my, my husband worked at a, a at a corporation where he helped to create these uh, these studies, right? And like they they looked at thousands and thousands of pieces of data, and and it just again and again, like diversity creates a better end result, um, and, and particularly teams that foster that the ability to be vulnerable with your teammates and are able to really, those are the highest performing teams. You get a bunch of like, you know, quote unquote rock stars together and they fight over power and struggle. They don't perform as well as people who are maybe not, you know, quote unquote, A-list talent but they're able to communicate and be vulnerable and make mistakes and recover from those mistakes. Um, and the, the data shows this. So um, yeah, there's so much to be said for diversity at every level. There's, I mean, there's no reason not, <laughs> no reason not to hire diversely and to create inclusive teams. Um, and I, I guess in, in ending this, we, we have five minutes left and I just wanted to see, um, you know, we, we've covered a lot of ground here, and I think there's so much more that we could probably each each say. Um, but I but I wanted to talk about like, you know, if there's anything that you feel like you really wanted to contribute to the conversation that maybe I haven't included, or or that you feel like needs to be to be said um, on this topic. I can go first if that's helpful. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll say just bringing it back to where we started in a way that to me when I, you know, 
documentary moving toward decolonization does require the centering of those values, right? The centering of land back, the centering of abolition and anti-capitalism and transformative justice. And to me, decolonization and documentary is needs to be beyond representation, right? It has to be representation, representation plus values. Because I think what I'm also, um, sorry, I'm like, that would be like a whole other hour long conversation. I was gonna bring up um, film, I was gonna bring up films that have representation of people of color, for example, Asian Americans, but then still magnify what essentially are like white supremacist narratives or values, right? So that's what I'm saying. Like it can't just be representation. It has to be representation plus those values. Um, so I guess that's what I'm thinking about in general, just remembering that this, that this title of the panel um, is decolonizing documentary where it's like, yeah, we know, we know what the goal is on the horizon and, and how do each one of these practices and do each one of these stories, how do they lay, you know, a small piece on the road toward that goal in the horizon? And then the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, because I'm about to go and uh, finish teaching my intro to documentary class, is that last semester um, I showed Softy to my students and I showed Midnight Traveler to my students and they both really, really loved it and the conversations were so rich and I wish that y'all had all been there. So thank you for your work and it's been, it's been such an honor to be in conversation with all of you. Amazing. That's so great <laughs> to hear. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for showing. Thank you for showing our, our work. Yeah. Maybe next time we can do a conversation about the film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think as a closing um, um, thought, um, I just think it's decolonizing is about radical honesty um, and truth telling about what the documentary um industry is like now um so that we can be able to rebuild and reimagine a more inclusive future and i would say that the burden of doing this work is not on bipoc communities the burden like christina said is also on you know people who are in a dominant position and i love for example um there's this uh, project called start with eight hollywood um, by Women of Color Unite, where they get mentors, um, um, mostly white uh, Western mentors who are very experienced to work with women of color um, 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 in, in the film industry. And I think we need to see more of those, we need to see more of those initiatives because it can't just be us doing this work, it can't. They also need to put in the work because these systems and structures also benefit them. So in as much as, we say it's not in their favor to do the work. They also need to do the work and we need to put pressure, continuous pressure for them to do it. Yeah, I just, um, in closing, I guess I just wanna say that I feel like, I've said this a couple of times, but like we're on the precipice of possible change for one of the first times in my entire life, do I ever feel like I can see mm -hmm. that something might happen, right? And I just, um, you know, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And I think we have to just keep um, riding this wave as, as far as we can, because again, at this point, it's it's mostly talk and not, not a lot of action yet. But um, I think as long as we keep ourselves healthy and um, in the game and moving, we can actually cause some real change right now. And that's exciting, whether it's it just, just in decolonizing documentary or in a larger sense in our society. So. I just want to encourage everyone to, to stay healthy, stay um, mentally healthy, and to keep going on the marathon as, as much as we can. That's a beautiful thought to end on. And I just want to thank all of you for such a generous and fascinating and really positive, like, you know, as we talked about, solutions-oriented conversation. Um, and I also just want to say again, like I admire all of your work and um, it's an honor to be able to be with you in community here virtually. And thank you again to the 
Athena Film Festival for hosting this really important conversation um, that we're having today. So it's wonderful to see you all.